freedom from bondage and the manifestation of God's power. Part 3. Death of the Firstborn God's judgment on Egypt and her gods. Application for today. Plague number 10. Death of the Firstborn Moses warns Pharaoh about the tenth and final plague, the death of the firstborn. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the meal, and all the firstborn of beasts, and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that he may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, and bowed down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. Before sending his final judgment on Egypt, God gave Israel instructions about how to escape this most grievous of all destructions. During the previous six plagues, God had spared Israel from his judgments, but this is different. This time, he gave them a choice about what to do. They could obey God or ignore his warning. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And he shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. He shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Note that the Lord did not say, that he would not enter into the houses of the Israelites to destroy their firstborn. He said that if he saw blood on their houses, then their firstborn would be saved. This was not about being born an Israelite, but about believing God. Likewise, many people think that because they were born into a Christian family or because they belong to a Christian denomination, God will accept them and they will escape his judgment. But the Passover teaches us that salvation is a personal choice for each person to make. It is not inherited. It cannot be assumed, and no one can make the decision for another person. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive, that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. For there was not a house where there was not one dead. God always keeps his word. He told Moses to warn Pharaoh at the outset that if Pharaoh refused to release Israel, God would kill his firstborn. Pharaoh refused to believe or obey God, despite warnings, time, and miracles. And he paid dearly for his stubbornness, pride, and rebellion. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both he and the children of Israel, and go. Save the Lord. As he have said, also take your flocks and your herds, as he have said, and be gone, and bless me also. How many disasters had to happen, including the death of his own son, 
before Pharaoh let the people of Israel go. Yet, all of it could have been avoided if Pharaoh had been willing to submit to God. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. To go by day and night, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. Pharaoh was a man who refused to learn from his mistakes. He was so invested in his Jewish slaves that nothing would convince him to let them go. Not the destruction of his nation, not the well-being of his people, not even the death of his own son. He could not accept that he had lost Israel. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal The Israelites stopped before the sea and saw that Pharaoh and his army were pursuing them. One moment they were free. The next, they were faced with recapture or certain death. What should they do? They had seen God's great miracles. They had experienced his protection. They had been released from bondage. Did they call on God to deliver them from this new and present threat? No. They immediately turned on Moses and accused them of taking them into the wilderness to die. But God had not delivered them from Egypt to kill them in the wilderness. God always has a plan. This was not a surprise to him. He did not catch him unprepared. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a war unto them on their right hand and on their left. Once again, God demonstrated his great power in doing the impossible. He opened up a way through the sea for Israel to walk across on dry land. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. And the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a war unto them on their right hand and on their left. What were the consequences of Pharaoh's pride? The destruction of Egypt, the collapse of the economy, the death of their sons, the obliteration of Pharaoh's entire army, the death 
of Pharaoh himself. And the judgment of God on Egypt's wicked religion and false deities. God had declared in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Each plague was designed to demonstrate the superiority of the true and the living God over the Egyptian idols. Egypt had a multiplicity of gods, and each plague dealt a blow to the gods of the Egyptian pantheon. The following table lists all ten plagues and some of the gods whose power they challenged. The plague, water turns into blood. Happy, god of the Nile. Invasion of frogs. Hecate, frog goddess. Lice, set, god of the desert and storms. Swarms of insects. Capri, a god with the head of a fly or a beetle. Livestock deaths. Epis, a sacred bull. Boils, Isis, goddess of medicine. Hell, Newt, goddess of the sky. Locust invasion, Osiris, god of the harvest. Darkness, Horus, god of the sky. Death of the firstborn, Min, god of procreation. The Egyptians had a deity or several, for every aspect of life and occasion. Most particularly, these idols played a part in the great mortuary rituals and in the Egyptian belief in posthumous eternal bliss. They had no problem with a multitude of gods, and they simply added new ones to their list as they evolved over time. The Lord God showed the Egyptians that none of their gods, which they created for themselves, could resist or defeat him. He clearly demonstrated the power of the living God against the futility of their empty religion. Not one of their 2,000 idols, nor all of them together, could withstand the one true and living God. I am the Lord. There are many lessons we can learn and some parallels we can draw from the account of the judgments on Egypt and the deliverance of God's people. Pharaoh, in his pride, stubbornness, and rebellion against God, and his determination to keep people in bondage, is a type of the devil. Egypt is a type of the world. The slavery of the Israelites is a picture of man's bondage to sin. Sin takes us further than we wanted to go, keeps us longer than we wanted to stay, and costs us more than we ever wanted to pay. The deliverance of the Israelites by the blood of the lamb sprinkled on the rintels points to the cross, which sets man free from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. The pursuit of the Israelites by Pharaoh symbolizes the devil's attacks on a person once they are saved, to try and return them to the world and become ineffective for God. Just as Pharaoh was defeated, so will the devil be defeated and cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. Egypt has enormous symbolic meaning in the Bible. Israel's redemption from Egypt is a picture of man's deliverance from sin and death through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For the believer, Egypt represents the old life of slavery to sin. All people are, by nature, slaves of sin, toiling powerlessly under its weight, and Satan is a much crueler taskmaster than Pharaoh. God redeemed these people from slavery in Egypt by the blood of the Lamb on the first Passover, and he redeems man from sin by the blood of the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Just as God called his people Israel out 
of bondage in Egypt, he calls his children to come out and be separate from the world and live holy lives for him.